All right, Gary, um, this, is a, this is a good one today. This has been a very fun rabbit hole to go down the last few days, I must say. Yeah, and it's extensive, isn't it? Because, he's, he, you know, the music that, that this band and, and Mike have made has, has been so diverse. Including one of the first riffs I ever learned on the guitar. So, um, What song? Uh, Squonk. Very, oh, yeah. very simple. It's just D minor 9, D minor 7 to minor 9. It starts in a bit like a like a white snake record. That I mean, I think they were sort of. You it's know, quite a meaty, rocky groove. There's a big fat, you know, that'll be Mike Moog Taurus bass on it. They were inventing the eighties, like in in the late seventies, really, weren't they? With a lot yeah, of I guess it's one way. Of, yeah, but it's, but it's fascinating to see what their roots are because it's because there's no roots to this thing. You know, there's no obvious blues. To, there's no obvious path to no, where I'm, they. I'm fascinated by the by that psychedelic late 60s early 70s pastoral folk where did all that come from that storytelling yeah. that victoriana but listen i mike and and we us three have something in common other than being looked after by the great tony smith for sourceful of secrets who manages sourceful of secrets and genesis we also have something else in common what do you think it might be skiing <laughs> <laughs> i have actually been skiing with mike so all three of us have played with Nick Mason. Oh, there you go. Because Mike played at the played "Wish You Were Here" at um, at the closing ceremony of uh, of, of the, the Olympics, 2012 Olympics. Yeah, no, that's a very good one. And he's actually uh, my missus is actually related to Mike Rutherford. Oh, in, in what capacity? I think it's they have the same great grandmother or something. <laughs> we'll find out more, <laughs> shall we? Yeah, let's get Mike Rutherford on. Welcome to Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. There we go. Ah. How is you? Very well. We can't see you, Mike. Uh, hang on. I'm gonna, I'll do that. You can now. I think. There you Yay, are. There you oh, are. My word. There you go. What a guitar collection. <laughs> it's only there because if I face the other way, it's, it's, it's the window and you can't see me. <laughs> I have that problem so, here, Mike. So I've got a light in my face. So it's like I'm in an interrogation. You look, you look about normal to me. That's all right. That's how I see you. <laughs> they are gorgeous uh, guitars up there, Mike. But you know what? Until about two years ago, they were in the studio in the barn in flight cases, you know, in boxes. So I never saw them. So I have to yep. get, get them all out, uh, the ones I like here, and then just sort of, at least I can sort of get to them, you know what I mean? Well, I can't see any double necks there. They're, that's more difficult to hang up, really, isn't it? It's over there. Oh, there it ah. is. Oh, who makes that? What make is that, Mike? That's the new one, isn't it? Well, basically, you just, you just get, I just had a Yamaha bass and a, a Gibson, I think it was, 12-string, cut the top off one, bottom off the other, and someone joined them up. <laughs> nice. It's that simple. But the trouble with that is you can't get any firm sponsoring you and making a copy, can you? Because you've, you've got two different guitar brands. My guitar tech, Steve, who loves guitars, he oh, yes, has a Korea, Korean firm do a Mike Rutherford copy um, oh, okay. for a thousand, for thousand dollars. So I ordered it. Oh, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately, the gap between the two necks was so big, it was like it was like <laughs> like a sort of dodgy mirror, you know, one of those sort of circus <laughs> mirrors, <laughs> unplayable. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, my on that, I've actually, I, it's not deliberate. They just happen to be here, but I do actually have my bass pedals in honor. Uh, yep. I've got some, yeah. Taurus. We were, no, we, these no. aren't Taurus. No, it's got, I've got the thing called the mini tour. Actually, we don't want this to turn into a sort of gear. No, sure. Because the thing is, Mike, I mean, obviously, when we, we like to prepare for these things, a couple of, and this, I've got to say, has been one of the most fun ones to go down an old Genesis rabbit hole for the last few days and remember all that, you know, how important that stuff was to us. So, because Gary and I are both old. You probably know more than I do right now, actually. <laughs> well, 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 we'll get to that then. But yeah. first then we'll, we'll, we'll plug into your short-term memory, which might well be better, and just oh, say, you know, and ask, <laughs> uh, how, how you've, you've had an extraordinary uh, lockdown because you ended up doing a month's rehearsal with, with Genesis, didn't you? Yeah, well, we, well basically, we, we had a rehearsal last January in uh, New York to sort of try out to see if we were any good. Could play the songs, you know, try out Phil's son who's drumming. 
um, and it went well. So we said, well, let's rehearse uh, last October, November uh, for the tour in November. We booked, we booked the hall, LH2, and um, of course then lockdown came and everything. And we thought, you know, we're we crazy rehearsing because basically it may never happen. What are we doing? And then we sort of thought, if we don't do it now, and it goes back another year and a half, we'll, we'll just forget, we'll, we'll just go like, forget it. It's not meant to be. So we thought, let's rehearse anyway. And then we've got a show we're sort of excited about, you know, keeps the momentum going. So in that last October, November lockdown, when the whole place was quiet, we were in LH2 with you know, 90 crew and lights and sound and music and in our bubble. Um, and it went well, actually, you know, we came out with a show that I think is, uh, I think is good. So we're kind of ready to go. And how did it feel to be to be back together and have, have Phil singing out the front? Yeah, good. I mean, he does, he's, not, he's, he's not mobile like he used to be, in a sense. But, I mean, you know, we've been going for over 50 years. And I think there's a nice chemistry, as you know, being in a band. You know, just, just the sort of the banter. You know, so many things, comments I make, only Phil and Tony know what they mean. You know what I mean? About our history. Um, and it was just nice spending time together, uh, getting the music together. And a, a big plus two was Phil's son, Trevor Nicholas, uh, who was fantastic. And that's and it's Daryl and Chester still. Nope, not uh, Nicholas oh. is replacing Chester. Oh. Chester oh, right. sort of re- uh, he sort of retired. And, and well, in a way, Phil's last touring, he did a couple of years, two and a half years on, on his solo stuff, and Nicholas drummed. Um, and he sort of said, "Look, you know, well, you know, if we do, if Genesis do something, I'd like Nick to drum." Uh, and we said. Uh, yeah, he's great. Kind of sounds a bit like he's a bit like Phil. I mean, Chester was fantastic, but because Nicholas is Phil's son, he's mm. kind of got an English feel to the songs, and it's almost in some ways it's almost easier to play actually. Yeah, I saw I saw uh, Phil at Hyde Park uh, a few years ago, and uh, his son was playing, and it was extraordinary. I think he was sixteen at the time. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I love the way all these old all the old musicians on stage, you know, Daryl Sturmer and uh, Leland Sklar, were a bit like. I'm not sure he can do it. And he was fantastic. <laughs> That's become a big thing, isn't it? Lots of people have their kids now, don't they? Sting has Dominic Miller's son out with Dominic playing guitar. And... I like it. Yeah. And the Eagles as well. I think this is going to be the sort of transition, isn't it? That, the, you know, the certain children will carry the flag and take over the bands, whatever. Ba- yeah, bands will just become dynasties, won't they? They'll just go for hundreds of years now. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to be able to ha- <laughs> ha- step back, hand over? <laughs> there you go, son. You're on your own now. I love the idea. <laughs> and... and- and obviously, we're all you're you're on in September, right? You're, you're, the tour is happening in September. Well, it's the, it's got a chance. I mean, uh, let's let's hope so. I mean, I can't quite see it at the moment, but then you never know. Listen, two, three months ago, England felt very different to how it does now. Hmm. Um, it'd be great to do it. Yeah, we'd be with the tour to mid September. Uh, let's hope. And, and the thing is about you guys is you've 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 ne- you three have never fallen out, have you? You've not gone through the routes that so many bands do where they just won't talk to each other. Was it easy to pick up the phone to Phil again and say, do you fancy doing this? I mean, how did that happen? That well, we sort of, we had, we sort of, we had the same manager, which always helps, Tony Smith. Um, and yeah, so do we. we had a, <laughs> sorry, what, I completely forgot that. As I said, it's <laughs> the old bastard. Yeah, exactly. um, you can speak freely here, Mike. <laughs> oh, now I can really have a go at him. Um, I think what happened was last last summer, summer before, the mechanics were touring. We did about six shows uh, supporting Phil on, on his stadium tour around Europe. Um, and I did a song with Phil on, on stage, Folly Follow Me, you know. And we sort of had a chat about it. And at the end, end of the last tour, we had a band meeting and said, look, should we just give it a go, you know? And uh, he seemed up for it, really. Um, you know, it's not going to be one of those tours where you go off and you come back a year later it'll be a month at a time you know sort of 18 20 shows knowing tony smith 23 shows um <laughs> and uh, a five weekend month and um uh yeah it, it felt fun though we have to go back now we, we have do. to go we back. do find out where we have to do this do this the shimmering <laughs> the mists of time because, I mean, it started at school and then never finished, right? Yeah. Which is extraordinary. I mean, you, you went straight, you know, a, a fellow old boy turns up and puts you in the studio and off you go. Yeah, all those little things. I do believe in luck. I mean, the funny thing is it, it's worth mentioning that, you know, we planned to be songwriters, never a band, really. And then at the time we sort of left school, the era before where the, the songwriters and the singers had sort of stopped, it became bands who wrote their own songs. So someone said, well, you should form a band. Uh, never our intention, really, um, but it it, 
it, how it sort of came. I think the songwriting is very important too. But that's what's. I, but I think that, that's what's driven you on with Mike and the Mechanics, hasn't it? It's just the, is the urge, the need to write, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, I mean, occasionally you, know. you think. Uh, Tony Banks made a lovely line about touring. He said, "You know, why is he doing it? You're not sure you're enjoying it, but when you finish it, you think, God, that was fantastic.'" And he's sort of right, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's interesting that you you wanted to be songwriters um, because obviously you know we're talking about the late sixties and and already plenty of boys wanted to be in bands at that point. Do you think? And, and I, I don't knock me down for mentioning class, but I need to to think about this for a second. Do you think the fact that you weren't, you know, because bands tended to be mostly working class lads, the fact that you all went to Charterhouse. Did that have any um, feeling that you could give you a feeling that you couldn't form a band, that you had to do something that was like about songwriting, that was a, that was slightly different? Oh, I see, a, a higher play. No, I don't, I don't think it was that. I think you've got to imagine the moment. Well, uh, I'm a bit older, but in a sense, you know, what was going on in the U, in the UK? That amazing sort of in the sixties, the Beatles. Is it a seagull or a dog? It's a seagull. Yeah, sorry, I'm in Brighton. Remember? <laughs> ah, I just get our, our location. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> Just so I know where you are now. Um, I think, no, it wasn't so much that. I think also we were quite shy public school boys. You know what I mean? The thought of going on stage was all, a bit sort of um, far-fetched for us, really. Right. Even Peter, you know, Gabriel, who became the most amazing front man, he was naturally and still is naturally shy. Yeah. So I think it was more the fact being in a, on stage wasn't really part of our makeup. Because it's very interesting, because that first album, which, is, uh, which, which has got lots of very swinging 60s sort of stuff on it, and is obviously so removed from what you were to become it's just interesting to see what um to know what was feeding into you. obviously you loved all the, the bands and stuff that were around but it's interesting well, what was feeding into your music because you don't you didn't seem to come from the same place as anyone else it's, it's not the blues route it's not the soul route it was you know this whole pastoral thing that you it's just you know there's in a documentary about you where daryl Sturmer says well it's not blues not country rock it's genesis in a way there was also so many ideas uh, in a band, which is, of course, where we ended up with the three piece, probably, but um, there were almost too many ideas. And you're right, that's what bands are about. It's a mixture of musical taste, you know, it's sort of. Mm -hmm. But what turned you on, Mike? What was your. Yeah. Uh, I was sort of, I mean, what a great time to be growing up. Beatles, Stones, Small Faces, Kinks, Procol Harum. I mean, it was great music going on around us at the time. Um, and I always think, you know, in those days, it was like a blank canvas. You know, there weren't many bands. So you get a band like Procol Harum. They sounded unique. Um, I think there were now so many artists and bands. It's kind of hard to be like that. Um, so it was, it was an exciting time in a sense. And I suppose bands like the Moody Blues as well might have been on. Yeah, yeah. But this idea of starting that that you were you were writing songs that were sort of more like overtures. <laughs> I know. Well, it was an important time. We left Charterhouse and decided to give it a go. Of course, when you when you're that age, a go is three months at the most. You know, over the summer. <laughs> Did you have a plan B? Not really. No, <laughs> no, no one does really. I always say I would say the word journalist. I could, but I, I didn't really mean it. Just somebody that when they ask, that, ask me that question, it's something I can say. You know, it sounded it sounded relevant. Um, not really, but I love the way when you're young, you know, a year is a lifetime. When your parents yeah. say what you're going to do, you know, and so we went away, and this is probably important to a cottage in Dorking, and we just wrote for about four or five months. Uh, wrote, argued, uh, um, lived off beans and brown rice and um, wrote, you know, removed from the world and just wrote ideas uh, and so many sort of sounds and bits came in and suddenly you found you've got, unintentionally, you've got a sound. You don't quite know how you got it. But especially, you especially as, because this is in the fact that you didn't have a bass, that you were the bass player, but then you weren't the bass player and there wasn't, you, you know, you obviously never, you never thought you were going to have a bass player but, or you were just going to do that and or whoever had a hand free. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, uh, myself and Ant Phillips, the original the guitar, I mean, he was a better guitarist by a mile, so obviously he played guitar and I played the bass. But a lot of the songs, as you say, were two acoustic guitars and the old bass pedals, which I can see sitting behind you right now. Well, exactly, but because this is because you were, because I must say, because you were the original A-team guy. I mean, because, you know, for me as a kid, the fact that you had all the gear, you had the double necks, you had the pedals, you had the, you play guitar, you play bass, you know. But you do have what what I do think is a... A rare talent, Mike, which is that usually when guitarists play bass, you can tell. I can always tell. But you, I mean, you, and you're actually, your your nimbleness, your chops seem to actually lie in the bass more than anything else. Finally a compliment. Great. Um, I like no, the, that was uh, only on, like the bass on, no. on, on Know What I Like. It's fantastic. 
Well, I think you're so right, like, about a lot of guitar, like in the mechanics, we have another guy's always played guitar and bass and I swap. And like with Daryl I've always Sturman, spotted like, that. I remember Tim Rennick yeah, play, playing for you. And yeah, when he picked up really the bass, it. it's like he's an amazing guitarist, but it's like, mate, that ain't it. <laughs> well, because da Daryl Sturman now, he's been with us playing guitar and bass for over 40 years. And the first eight, nine years, he didn't really get it. He played the right notes, but then suddenly he kind of got it. Yeah, it's, it's indefinable, isn't it? But, but I think that sound that you and Ant Phillips created, the yeah. first guitarist, of the dual 12 string picking, was it was something you discovered that that Steve Hackett had to take over with? Even actually, some of some of Ant Phillips's lovely sort of volume swells that he did, yeah. which mm. you could, which Steve had to develop and then and then and then make his own. But that sound was something that became the Genesis sound, didn't it? That twelve string dual twelve string thing. Yeah, it was very much how we kind of a large part of the set, two twelve strings, often playing notes in harmonies, um, and. Um, I mean, Ant was a huge influence on, on the band. I think he was the driving force, really, for the first two or three years uh, until he left. Um, and we must give him a huge credit for that. But uh, in a sense, the two acoustic guitars, so if you've got two acoustic guitars and you want a bit of bass, it's pedals, otherwise you don't get any bass in. And the first, uh, our Genesis set, the first 20 minutes used to be acoustic, uh, at least 20 minutes. And so until the drums came in, no one left the bar, you know. Oh. And who, how did you hear about Sorry. pedals? Because who was who was using pedals then? Oh, I, mean, I don't know. I don't Good question. You know. Yeah, I think you might have Good been. The, you're the first I person I, I knew of who played pedals. Yeah, I don't know. It seems, I guess, because, because you know, I play, I play guitar and bass. So in a sense, you're missing the bass, uh, but you like two guitars together. You said the uh, answer to me had a great sound there, I think. And the pedals took us a bit further. <laughs> And let's just let's just have a, li a little bit of anecdotal stuff as well, because what I find extraordinary, and I always did, I remember thinking this was extraordinary as a kid, that that Jonathan King came up with your name and was was your your sort of the person who discovered you. Because I mean, Jonathan King at that point had, had made uh, some sort of weird pop record. What was it? Everyone's called? gone to the moon. Yeah, wasn't it? yeah. And was sort of was seen as a kind of you know pop Svengali, but not someone anything to do with prog rock. I know it's funny, but but that's why I say so much of this our business is luck. He came, you know, we if he hadn't come down and heard some songs which one of our mates put in his car on some sort of sports day, probably or old old boys' day, and he heard a song and liked them, we had a chance to make our first album in the summer holidays. You know, we could barely play really, but to that chance to do it got us so excited about doing music. I think without that, it might never have happened. So there's sort of those sort of funny things that, and he was miles away from where we were going to go really but it gave us a start to sort of get going. But there's something so fantastically English about making an album in your summer holidays. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. And it took, I'll tell you what, it, it, took three, it took three days, which in those days was luxury. Yeah, that was Sergeant Pepper, mate. In, Den <laughs> in Denmark Street, wasn't it? In the studio yeah. in Denmark Street. Yeah, it was. Um, always, always in the basement. Um, in fact, recently I did some uh, mechanics, I did a mechanics or acoustic recording of a few songs in a basement in Old Cobner Street. And I thought, this is where I started. It all came back, you know. Oh. Do you remember what Peter was like at the time? Because, I mean, you know, you're at the birth of this extraordinary performer. You're part of that. And uh, how, how, was it a, a, a shoe in for him to be a singer? And his style, that was quite unique, too. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, I remember sort of Pete's, Pete's, I think you look at our music and you can't understand the inferences. Pete was like sort of always R&B, Nina Simone, kind of soul music. Um, like kind of R&B was a huge part of, him especially, uh, the rest of us too. And so to then end up singing, as you say, what, what he ended up singing is quite bizarre, really. Yeah. But I think may maybe the key sometimes is that you write a long song, it's actually easier than a short song. You get a great bit, another great bit, you go up and you go down. Um, <laughs> and so vocally, you can, you can go crazy, really, and lyrically. Yeah, but what he did on something like Supper's Ready and what you all did and what was so special and what turned me on as a kid, here's this you know, kid who doesn't go to church, who doesn't, you know, never has any religion in his life. Supper's Ready was my church. You know, it would begin with the most simple lyric about something I even I could understand, you know, getting up and turning the television on or whatever, and would end up at the New Jerusalem. You know, it was, and in, <laughs> in, that, in those 20 minutes, you'd, you'd gone into an ethereal plane, somewhere completely extraordinary. That to me was what Genesis were about. Yeah, I, loved not, I mean, probably my favorite sort of old song because it, it, it kind of worked. And I remember, I remember there were certain moments in the studio which you all know where you kind of go, well, hey, uh, when Pete came to sing the vocal uh, on the end of the Jerusalem bit, you know, um, I didn't know what he was going to do. He hadn't sung there before. And I came back and heard a 666 bit 
and it was just like wow that's, that's amazing you know uh one of those moments and the hair on your arms kind of goes and uh but it was and also like all these things you know when we did it we didn't quite know what we'd done it was all we put it all together we joined two bits up and there were no you know they were slightly out of tune so we had to get a little monitor on and turn the note down a bit so it, they married <laughs> up um but i love those sort of things yeah yeah, but I was wondering because if it was actually if it would fit on one piece of tape. But what gave you the idea that you could do that? That you could do sort of a twenty-minute piece? I mean, was were, were Pink Floyd influencing you at all in that time? Or? I didn't. I didn't really know the Floyd music yeah. very well then. Now I, mean, I, I know it and I like it now. I didn't for some reason. I didn't really. Uh, was that before King Crimson? I can't remember. Maybe no, King Crimson. I like. Oh yeah, King Crimson. Uh, yeah, Crimson would. would but I think have. in a sense you just Definitely. you just bang it all together and have a good time. And cross your fingers, really. You know what I mean. You, you don't quite know why why they're doing what you're doing. Well, they, but, but what I'm saying, and I think is because we're trying to find the history because we're a little bit younger, and we and it, and I've never quite seen where all the dots join up. So you suddenly got people wanting to write, sing in an English accent, to write about sort of English whimsy and Victoriana and nostalgia to a certain extent, but also saying let's not just stay playing 4-4, let's do odd time signatures as well, and let's extend the music. What's in the air at this point? Well, I think, you know, quite a lot of it, like a lot of it, some of the stuff, as you can see, was, was kind of written as bits, like the intro bit, myself, Anton, Tony, the acoustic guitars, and then later on, the sort of the, the, the jamming, the solo bit at the end uh, was in, I think it was 9-8. That's, that's a jam thing. And of course, Phil's a big part of that, you know what I mean? Because he, he made... Funny signatures seem very. Oh, I love writing in seven too. Uh, it makes them seem very comfortable to play with. And I think, in a sense, there were no there were no holes barred. There was no sort of nothing held you in. There was no A and R guy. There was no one saying how's it going to go. There was no market out there. We kind of wrote it for us, really, to excite us. Um, it was an exciting time. Yeah. What you're saying, your record company were basically saying just make do whatever you want. Because yeah, it's, clearly not, how, get, it's clearly not going to get on the radio, is it? It's Absolutely. 20 minutes long. <laughs> no chance. Alan, Alan Freeman on a Saturday afternoon might play it, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a bit Excerpts. Of it. Excerpts, uh, wouldn't it? Yeah, best of. But uh, in a sense, <laughs> it was quite a liberating time because you didn't feel constrained by song lengths, what people thought. You know, you just sort of, when did it really? I um, think the question uh, is, who invented prog rock? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. For God's sake, Mike. <laughs> I, uh, well, I'm glad you asked. No, it's, but I think in a way, you know, it was such an early time. You think of music, music coming out now, the whole world hears it straight away. In those days, you got a chance to sort of make a bit of a start of something. It's a blank canvas. There weren't many bands around, you know, so there were no rules. There was no how to do it. And strangely enough you know we love the Beatles and the, the small faces and all and King Solo's great singles but we couldn't really do that and so we just did, did our, we just got some great bits joined them together argued had some more great bits um and some worked and some didn't work so well but also I mean, that's where I guess Phil turning up must have I mean that must have just opened up such a world because suddenly you've got that you've got this incredible thing that you can that, that everything's going to sit on top of We'd had, we'd had three and you, or then four, you can basically yeah. play whatever you want and Phil's going to take care of it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's because he was extraordinary. He was. And, and also, it, he, added, you know, he, added, he added a, a degree of humour. You know, we were sort of three or four intense public school boys. A bit, uh, and, then, and then Phil comes along with a kind of his more worldly feeling and sense of humour, the drummer, the joker, you know what I mean? And it, it lifted the atmosphere a bit. I was joking with Guy the other day when we were talking about you coming on, and we're both mass massive Genesis fans, obviously. But so please don't take offence at this. We said, but I said if if Genesis was Black Adder, then Phil was Baldrick, and Baldrick <laughs> took over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell him that one. Um, I don't, yeah, no, please no, don't. Please but don't. I think, <laughs> I think I mean by that is, is, I mean, certainly he was coming from a slightly different, you know, background to to you guys. Well, he he'd literally, and he played the Artful Dodger, hadn't he? I mean, he literally was that yeah. character, wasn't he? Saturday Morning Pictures, he starred yeah. in as well, which is which is exactly my background. I I was child actor doing Saturday Morning Pictures as uh, movies as well. He um, went to the bar, yeah, the Barbara Speaks Stage School, which he, his mother ran with Bar Barbara Speaks. So in a sense. Later on in life, as it comes out, he became a singer. You kind of go, well, no wonder he made it work. But at the time, it was a bit nerve-wracking. But, uh, you know, he was a great, great part of the band and so enthusiastic about everything. But, you know, as you know, drummers, a drummer can lift a song, lift a band by 30%, you know what I mean? And he did a that. band is only as good as its drummer. I mean, I mean if Phil would dies just, on that, that's, you know. If Phil was just a drummer, he would be one of the greatest drummers in the world. And that's we just think, well, that's it. He's genius. But he adds to that songwriter and he adds to that a great singer. In fact, you, he sings on the first album he records with you. He sings a track on 
on, on nursery crime, doesn't he? Absent friends. I don't know. It might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah I mean. It, it, I forgot what the track is. Yeah, it's absent friends. Yeah. How, how did how did that? So he comes in and then he muscles his way in. To, to well, no, it was, it was it, uh, of course, what's nice, you know, uh, Peter always loved someone else. First of all, Peter's a real rhythm person. So Phil on the drums, the way he played, got Pete going. And Phil sang a lot with Peter, you know, harmonies, double the voice. Um, and uh, Pete loved that. You know, having, having someone else to sing with. Um, and uh, I think... Um, it just sort of happened. I can't remember how it happened actually, but there was no. It was a bit like, and you came on stage and they sang it actually, one of those songs in a sort of white dungaree suit, and uh, the crowd. In fact, the crowd loved him actually. Even then, you know, he's got that sort of persona. That, and also he was a break from the kind of rather dramatic, heavy sort of prog, or around us because the music is dark and intense. And then there's Phil, who is not dark and intense in a good mm -hmm. way. And um, Steve Hackett, where did so where, where did he where did you find him? Um, melody maker. What did the ad say? Well, I remember Phil's not, one. No time Phil, wasters, Phil, not on no, heavy Phil, trip. <laughs> Phil's one said, drummer sensitive to acoustic music is what he said. Um, and, but Steve Hackett, I think it was his advert actually. Ah. Um, and the weird thing was, Ant, Ant Phillips left and I, and I, I think I had bands of the fever and I couldn't find, a, we couldn't find a guitarist. And I was being difficult because no one could replace Ant. And I think while I was ill and off, off work a bit, they found Steve, um, who was fantastic actually. A real sort of sounds man. Because yeah. that your writing partner, wasn't he, Mike? Yeah. It so was that, very much Ant and myself and, and Peter and Tony. So that um, must be hard for you. And you had to do, do create this. Did you feel you had to create the same thing with Steve or did it draw you closer to Peter and Tony? Probably that. I mean, because in a sense, initially when Steve joined, he didn't write as much, um, I think, as Peter and, and, and I and Tony did. Um, and so it was more... Steve's real strength, I thought, was, was such an incredible guitarist with sounds, lead guitar with sounds and quirky, weird stuff, you know, kind of like a wild Robert Fripp. Mm. Um, so that was more, yeah, so I couldn't, we never quite, it didn't quite become what Ant and I were because we didn't really write together so much, just in a band format. So after that, it, it was, there was still a sense of, it must still have been a sense of you three and, and that Phil and, and, and Steve were kind of the new boys. I mean, Phil said recently that, that he still feels like the new boy in the band. He still is, yeah. Um, no, you still. It probably, it probably was actually. Uh, and I, I sometimes think that looking back and hearing how Steve felt, I mean, he felt a bit, a bit left out in a sense. Steve, which probably, you know, he probably was. In fact, I think we're probably guilty of that. Well, if you've got guys who are at school together, I don't think there's any way you can ever fix that. You can't change that, yeah. can you? That's a, you know. Yeah, and I, I think we always felt that musically. We should work on the bits that sort of everyone liked most of all, you know, but we were probably stronger force than he was, and I said, but I mean, this is great work, Steve. That early sound of what you were, it was, was very, very particular, you know, the St Steve's non-bluesy, not, it doesn't bend the notes. Yeah. Wonderful legato sort of sound he used. Soundscape stuff. Soundscape yeah. stuff. And then, and then Tony, who never plays a pad, he's, he's constantly arpeggiating and moving around. And that which complements the, the twelve string arpeggiation that you, you've 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 delivered. For me, the that's dancing on the pedals. The texture, <laughs> the textures in Genesis. But then to add to that the visuals, and and we'll get to that moment I think very soon when 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 in Foxtrot when you're in Dublin or somewhere when oh, people yeah, yeah. dress up. But before then, you was it before then that you played at the Atomic Sunrise? concert with yes that was that would have been that was very early wasn't it where was that i know that, i remember the name where was it where was it it's a roundhouse yeah march 1970 uh, and bowie yeah. the famous gig for bowie because it was the first time he played with mick ronson uh with the band called the hype and they'd all dressed in some sort of escapade uh fancy dress and they were all like wearing silver clothes and do you remember that mike i do i do i mean also the roundhouse then was a bit scruffy you know the floor was a bit brick brick laden and dusty and um, it was almost like blur because when you, those sort of festivals, it's like you get your beat, you come on, the gear's half working, you know, it's, it's kind of gone before you know it. Yeah. Uh, and it's since the gigs become sort of more famous than it was at the time. But and also, you know, we were quite hard to, to listen to, I think. You didn't know our music. We come on, we play a whole set of, of, of not so complicated, complicated stuff. It's quite hard to take, take it in, I think. Because your rehearsals for live must have been quite, I mean, that you had a lot to remember. <laughs> it wasn't just like, but right, you, 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 but 12 you must bar in G. <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, you didn't really rehearse because you were playing all the time. You know what yeah, I mean? So true, you, yeah. you added some new songs. It wasn't like go away for three weeks and, and like it is now. I'm trying to remember the songs you wrote. 
Um, but it was, uh, and we, we felt we felt very junior in the music world. We really felt like the new boys. <laughs> who were your mates? So who were your peers? Who were your who became your friends? Who were the, the people you well, hung out with? Well, we didn't uh, musically. We didn't really have. I mean, you know, you get on the road. Interesting. After sort of a smart education, you get on the road. You're in the back of the transit van, you know, and you drive to up, up to Newcastle and you do the gig and you put the gear in. You drive back, get a couple of hours sleep. There was kind of no socialising. Yeah, I had, I had no sort of social life for two or three years. Um, but we loved what we were doing, so we did sort of drive ourselves. Um, and I remember the, going to the Blue Boar you know, on the motorway the first few yeah, times, the service yeah, station, yeah. three in the morning. And the first few times, you could sort of see these road crew thinking that, who are this sort of lot, you know? And after a while, we sort of earned our stripes, so to speak. And was it with, <laughs> was this sort of audience in those days it, it, with pop groups? It was kind of split into sort of bands that, that attracted women and bands that attracted boys. Great coats, so, great coats. Uh, <laughs> you were a, yeah. that band, yeah. weren't you, right? I can't quite... I mean, there's a big lack of women. It was serious young men in their sort of blue reefer jackets, whatever they're called, a big long sort of army type coats and yeah. serious, you know. Um, I think if it hadn't been for Aylesbury, for ours Aylesbury, in that area that liked us, you might never have survived, you know, because you have a little pocket that likes you in the country um, and that keeps you going. Did you play at Friars? You played at... Yeah, many times, yeah. That's where Bowie started as well, with the whole Ziggy thing. As, uh... David Stops, yeah, no, it, was, it was a great venue. A lot a of people, I mean, it's a whole, it's one of those places, it's kind of, it's sort of like England's sort of Detroit, in that it's it's like this area that's an absolutely breeding ground for bands, you know, like the Howard Aylesbury. Like... <laughs> I mean, Aylesbury twinned with Detroit. <laughs> so one of the most famous parts of your story is the one I alluded to earlier, which is the, um, uh, it's, I think it's at the National Stadium in Dublin, and I've got the date. Yeah. September 72, and something happens that Peter does that kind of changes everything for you, doesn't it? Do you remember? It was, it was, I do it very well. I'd like to remember. Um, Pete, since, you know, cause the reason Pete's performance happened is because you couldn't hear the words on the PA, so you kind of acted out parts. And so we're playing, we're playing uh, the music, and he suddenly appears on stage with the album cover image of him in a long red dress and a fox's head. He hadn't told us wisely, because we'd have said no. And you're playing along, and then he comes out, and you go, <laughs> and you know, you can stop, you know. Um, and, of course, the, and you're going, oh, my God, what is what, I don't know, is, it, is this good or what? The next day, Melody Maker, front page. And you kind of go, like this, sadly, that, that's how the world works, you know what I mean? But how the thing? But how long had he been planning? Because the whole thing had planned because you didn't know until he appeared on stage, and this was more than halfway through the show, right? But I mean, yeah. you wonder how long had he been planning it? Because it's he didn't just happen to have his wife's oh, dress no, and no, didn't no, find no, a sure, fox's sure. head backstage. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we planned it for, for a little while, but it sort of kind of made sense. And I think, in a sense, you look at it now, and uh, my sons went to see a Genesis tribute band at the Albert Hall a few years ago, and they said, "God, Dad, you were weird." And I said to them, yeah, but in those days, it wasn't quite like that. It was sort of stuff going on stage. You know, it was quite a strange time anyway, in a, in a nice way, you know. Mm -hmm. It felt less weird then. Foxtrot had already been out with that, that, yeah. that Paul, Paul Whitehead cover. And so he'd already created that look of the Foxhead yeah. girl in the red dress. And Peter's wife had, by a chance, a dress exactly the same as that drawing, it looked like, didn't it? Or yeah, did and, and, she? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 or was it Peter's? Yeah, and no, I think in a sense, the, the fact was that the album cover justified it. But it also just the stories that Peter was singing, because they were very theatrical. And they, you know, I mean, I think, was it the musical box? Sort of, someone yeah. gets head knocked off by a croquet ball and then comes back as an elderly ghost, horny elderly ghost in a music box. And, and then the nanny smashes the music box or something. I mean, it's just... The drama in those stories deserved some dressing up on stage, didn't it? Really? Yeah, the old man. I mean, I think it, it, at the time it felt it felt um, that it worked. You know, I think and Pete's performance is always very, you know, whereas Phil's the, the perfect guy next door, the crowd warmed yeah. to. Peter was this sort of presence that was sort of not so much darker, just odder, weirder, and he pulled it off though. And there, but there was never any temptation to join in. With the theatrics. No, I think I think two red dresses would have been a bit too much. Um, That's true. No, you're just too also, busy. You're just too busy, aren't you? You've got four necks and eight. I can't jump. Yeah, but also I think you know, <laughs> in a way, you have to be honest. I'm sure Peter' behaviour uh, on stage was because the rest of us didn't do anything. I sat down for the first three or four years, the entire set. That's right, you did. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. 
But I remember, you know, there were Which two... is brilliant because now you can go back to sitting down and everyone would think it's really cool. The rest of us try sitting down. Of course, I'm glad you mentioned that idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, re I remember distinctly, you know, as a kid, there were, there were two kinds of guitarists. So you love the rock and roll hero. You love the Mick Ronson, Pete Townsend. But also you were in great admiration of the ones who sat down like you and Steve, you know, who, and, and of course, Robert Fripp, you know, who, who were serious about their work. Uh, I You've got to be really good if you sit down. Though, yeah. You? That's <laughs> <laughs> well, the other reason I sat there is basically the bass pedal part. I couldn't play without using two feet, and I can't stand <laughs> and play two feet bass pedal at the same time. So I sat down for a bit. But I was, you know, I was a kind of shy, introverted kind of guy anyway, and so it took me a few years to stand up. But I got there in the end. <laughs> but I think the lamb right. is really is lamb. Really, yeah, come on. Selling Ingham by, by the pound gave you more, more, more sort of chart success, really. Because I mean, it's a beautiful. Yeah, was that like because you obviously? I mean, when selling, when um, I know what I like was a hit. Had, I mean, was that planned? Had you had a, a really? You hadn't really bothered with singles before or anything, had you? Or had you? Well, singles. You know, I mean, singles are hard to write. You know, they're not easy to make something work in three minutes. Although we grew up, you know, with the most fabulous writers, you know, all those, all those fabulous singles. Um, and I know I like, we just didn't develop it. It could have, could have gone in a long song, which left it was there. And of course, I remember there was a big drama, Top of the Pops, wanted us to go and play it. And I managed to totally thought, oh, great, you know. And we said, uh, we're not doing that, mate, you know. Because in those Did days, it was very much, the, no, they were like pop artists, um, Pickety Witch and Mud. Yeah. And those guys and and sweet and album bands. There were sort of two sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They definitely yeah. wouldn't play Top of the Pops. Pink Floyd wouldn't play Top of yeah. the Pops. Yeah. No. I saw years later, I did Top of the Pops with the mechanics, I think, and Robert Plant was there. And we kind of eyeballed and said, what are we doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of okay by then, yeah. It just occurred to me, thinking about long songs and you saying about putting different songs together and not being worried about that. I suppose, actually, the first people to do that was the Beatles in A Day in a Life, where yeah. you know, George Martin got Paul and John to stick their two disparate songs together and, and, it, and it worked. That's in a way, was one of the first concept records. Yeah, it's easier in some ways just to get up bits and join them together. I mean, not to get the right bits, but you know, to make something work in three minutes is quite hard. But that's, but it's seeing as you wanted to be a songwriter, isn't that kind of the goal, that, Mike, to get know. to what, say uh, what in three minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <So what happened? laughs> but so is that how you work? Yeah. It, would, would it be that with all your, with all your sort of sweets, as it were, would it be that sort of Tony had a bit, you had a bit, and then you stuck it together, or would it be? Well, more... no, or, or yeah, some of that, but sometimes we'd yeah. write a bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's all, it all starts with bits. Then does the bit become a song? Do you develop, develop, do you develop a bit? I mean, I just I had a life full of bits, really, and some are good and some aren't so good. <laughs> there's, there's, there's your book title, the Mike Rutherford, A Life Full of Bits. True. <laughs> <laughs> but also, obviously, at that period, there was a great folk revival going on. I mean, I remember going to folk clubs uh, as yeah. a 13, 14 year old and watching guys with their fingers in their ears singing and uh, uh, just in their ears. And. Um, <laughs> And, and of course, the bit I loved on that album, which still goes around and round in my head, occasionally I'll be walking along a street and I'll suddenly hear, can you tell me where my country lies? And it's like, wow. I mean, that is, Genesis are connected to the history of pop music, which is folk music. And, and it, it's, it gave sort of depth to the band, I, 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 I think, that particular thing. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think we were more influenced, actually, or more fonder of, not so much the traditional folk, more the sort of Joni Mitchell, um, oh, West right. Coast sound, I think. Right. That, that, Laurel uh, Canyon. Sort of. Yeah, that sort of... Um, uh, and actually, the other day, I'm driving back every night from rehearsals of Genesis, LH2 to home, it's about an hour and a quarter, and I'd do a Spotify every night. I'd go like, so tonight I'm going to do West Coast stuff. And the Crosby Stills and Nash stuff, there aren't oh, many yeah. songs, but they're, they're great, but there are only three or four songs, really, that do it. Um, <laughs> but it was sort of... Uh, yeah, it was more that sort of sound, but it was the sort of, sort of English folk we had, yeah. Because I don't hear that, but to, to be honest, because um, there, there are a lot of people who were quite sort of um, audibly trying to ape that whole West Coast thing. Yeah. But, and, you know, you clearly went somewhere else with it. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like you were doing that at all. But Phil, Phil did say, didn't he? Apparently, I've, I've read somewhere that he, when he was sitting outside the, the rehearsal room and before the audition and you're in there and drummers are playing Trespass, he, he thought to himself, oh, it Crosby, Stills, Nash vibe. And which he oh. loved. I mean, you know, he's a huge fan of that. And he ended up producing an album with Crosby just down the road here. Um, they were a fantastic band, that, but they're, they're only sort of a couple of albums really that did it for me. Watching the documentary you made in 2014, and 
it is quite fun, and I can feel the tension myself listening, watching between Peter and Tony on that yeah. footage. <laughs> and having been in a band that has suffered certain amounts of tension over the years <laughs> myself, <laughs> I completely related to it, but my toes did curl. And it's extraordinary for me that Tony still had a problem with Lamb because to me, it's one of the, one of the great pieces of work of the 70s. Uh, I mean, I, I'm probably slightly with Tony in, in that no, it's a great work. It was a hard album to make. And that always slightly colours it for you. You know what I mean? The album was the album was um, a bit disjointed. Also, making a double album, the advantage was that it gave us the freedom to do more stuff. But we got behind the clock, and we sort of ended up a bit like us doing a bit more music than Peter, and him doing a bit more words, which made sense to be it had to be had to be done by one person really, which I think bothered Tony actually. <laughs> come to think of it, um, it was nearly all Peter's at words, but I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, but it was also at the time a slight a sort of a, almost a time constraint thing. But also, right, yes, because if it was Peter's story, because I'm still, I'm, I'm still, I've never actually really known what the story is. But, um, no, no, really I mean, it's a <laughs> slightly, it's a slightly, it's a slightly I, just, I love the idea looking back at the time, thinking, you know, to write to the lead character to be a sort of a Puerto Rican street kid was very out of, out of the box in those days. It was that's the, the main person, Rail, you know, to have that as your sort of lead star story. Um, Actually, incredibly pressing of what was about to come, and there's a sort of leather jacketed punk in New York. Yeah, and it was, which is, you know, it was, I know, it was weird. Very... Like you saw what was on the yeah. horizon. Well, um, I think it I has did... what all Peter's songs had at the time. Like even we, we talked about Supper's Ready. The whole of, of, of the Lamb has that same thing of a guy trying to find himself from the mundane into the spiritual, and the album does end on that big spiritual note. It's in a way, it's it's, Supper's yeah. Ready just panned out over two albums. It's a sort of pil pilgrim's progress in a way. Yes. Yeah. Kind of, it's, it's that sort yeah. of journey thing. Um, and of course, we went to America with it and brilliant timing with our manager. When we first started touring, we played the whole album. So that's <laughs> a lot of music. Oh, that's right. And, and the album had, hadn't actually come, hadn't come out, out yet, had it? Yeah. <laughs> come out. I mean, Christ, you know. But so did you not think we should maybe to bung a bit of greatest hits in and sort of. We, we did a couple at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, but of course, the trouble with playing a double album is that some songs just don't lend themselves to being good live songs. Yeah. But you're tied to playing the whole thing, you know. But it was, uh, I haven't actually, I haven't heard it for years, you know. I've only heard bits. Um, I must give it a listen, in fact. Well, Carpet Crawlers is still great flying. Yeah. Oh, and uh, the, whole, the whole opening is, is just uh, epic. I, yeah, I, epic. I, was, I, was, I was very near the front row at Wembley, I think, when you, when you did it there. And I'm watching oh, this. Blimey, yeah coming out of the pod and all of that stuff and all of the dressing up. And it's one of the most extraordinary gigs I've, I, I ever went to. I really felt it as a, as a young boy, um, the theatricality of it, but it, it, it grated on the band. I mean, Tony still speaks today about, you know, maybe it was becoming Peter's show too much. Well, there was, there was a figure that I'm mean, not, Pete knows, I say, well, honestly, it was like a bit, of, you get slightly depressed as the band members, you know, having written a large part of it. As of course, the way it works, the, the press, go for the singer. Mm. Pete was the most amazing front man, especially the way he looked. And so you kind of presume that the Pope kind of, the Pope presumed that he wrote all the songs, um, which obviously he never pretended to and didn't, you know. So there's a slight feeling of, it wasn't a row, you just felt a little bit brought down sometimes, review, visuals, sound, Peter's costumes, and um, yeah. uh, the band played okay, you know. It wasn't a ball breaker, you know what I mean? We, we'd have, we, we wouldn't have broken the band up. But it was slightly, it, it bothered Phil probably almost most of all, Phil and Tony, me a little less. Um, but then, of course, uh, he, he, he left, we did that tour. Hang on, you all yeah. get it on though, Mike. Were, were you, oh, yeah. What was the pressure on Peter to leave at a time when you were first kind of beginning to break America? A, a, few, a few things, yeah. I mean, he, he's the first one to have a baby. Um, and of course, suddenly his life changes. And it was a difficult birth. And where, of course, Tony and Banks and I are sort of selfish, you know, pushing on with the tour, didn't make any allowances at all. It was tough for Peter. And then looking at it now, we'd have just said, OK, what do we need to do? You know, to make this work. Um, and I think maybe Peter thought possibly other reasons, you know, he'd written the whole lyrics for that thing, maybe felt it was kind of hard to surpass that. Um, and in a way, probably quite a brave choice, too, at the time to leave, I think, in a way. So in the old days, before that, before the lamb, you all joined in with lyrics. Would you write lyrics as well? Yeah. 
to these extraordinary stories, you know. You know. Yeah, I mean, so of course, the trouble, that's, that's how we, we wrote down songs by Genesis, and so no one knew who wrote what. So, of course, you presume that um, uh, the singer wrote most of them, that, that's, that's what I do, you know. Well, yeah, um, no, you and, wrote a lot, but you wrote lyrics for quite a lot of the later hits, didn't you? Yeah. But those those uh, earlier Genesis hits were uh, songs were very very sort of storytelling. But so we'd all muck in and come up and devise, you know, get them out by Friday or or you know. No, that I mean that the ones that were like I mean, in many ways the best ones are Peter's lyrics really. I mean he wrote the best lyrics by far. Uh, Banks and I wrote Watches of the Sky and other stuff. But Peter was definitely the. Oh my God! Don't get uh, me started. I, how much I love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pete was definitely the he was definitely the the, the uh, strongest lyricist by a long way. I mean, he wrote amazing words. Because of course, then you go on. Then it's trick of the tail, right? Which is and which was actually a brilliantly gradual transition. In that, like Phil sounds very much like Peter on that still. And actually, I, 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 there's a very important question I want answered, Mike. Which is that when that album came out, when I was at school, so you'd chosen the typeface deliberately so that the word trick was actually fuck. Okay, <laughs> that, that's that's the new one on me. <laughs> Well, that, love, that, that's these, classic schoolboy sort of... stuff. No, you know, they know exactly what they're doing. So that, that, it's, it's yeah. actually a fuck of the tail. No, that's what they're doing. That's boys in great coats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so uh, that's finally dispelled. Oh, okay, 45 years or whatever, I've re- waited for that, but now it's put to bed. But it's an interesting album, I think, what you're saying, Guy. You know, I did... I, my immediate thought when when Phil started singing was, wow, he sounds exactly like Peter. Exactly like, yeah, just like it yeah. made it. And, but it, and lyrically, it was still, it was all the whimsy and everything was still there. Well, maybe, you see, I'm, I'm a great believer in things happen. Change happens, which you didn't want to happen. Peter left, which is sort of sad. because You're never going to be close again. But then you go, OK, well, that's happened. So we're forced to change. So something new happens. Phil started singing. And so we just, like all these things, we just said, Let's, look, should we carry on? We weren't sure, you know, maybe it's time to call it a day. So we just said, let's write some songs and see what we think. And of course, the first three days sort of took off and we thought, wow, this, this is different, but good, you know. And you get, you get a sudden new fresh air, fresh ideas, fresh energy. And of course, like I said earlier, you know, the first live show in London, Ontario, I remember it in the verse, thinking, Christ, what's going to happen, you know? Because Peter was so strong on stage and he spoke so well. And seeing Phil stand there with his sort of hand shaking his little words, you know. And of course, he's up from the theatre world, you know. And he was fantastic. I saw you on that tour in um, in Toronto, actually. The exhibitions. I mean, it was a stadium. It was like the first stadium gig I ever went to. So you were, you know, you you were all guns blazing. What were you doing in Toronto then? Was that? That was when I I was a Laker boy. I got a Freddie Laker ticket when I was sixteen and hitchhiked across America. Yeah. Ah, anyway. you're that young. Okay. Uh, that so young, yeah, yeah. it's funny how things turn out. You know, Peter left was not what we wanted to happen, but it does, and you find a new energy. And of course, going down to three, there's more room spreading out your writing. We, we were full up, you know, with four people writing, five people writing. The band was chocked up, you know, one album every year. It wasn't a lot of output for music, so it's almost easier just having three of us writing. Well, that's that's, that's, funny, that's way of kind of it. how... But, it... Hang on, when you're down to the... But yeah, but, well, so hang on. This is before... Are you talking about after Steve went or before Steve went? No, in fact, before. So four, four of us, sorry. Yeah, because because when Steve goes, you must be going, oh, you're having a laugh now. <laughs> no, I, I, I never quite knew why Steve left, because actually, I thought we were doing okay. I suppose the trouble was sometimes, you know, you can't say there's four guys in the band, so you all write a quarter of the album. We were sort of slightly drawn on, on what we liked the best, and maybe Tony and I were a bit bossy, but um, I think it, I always felt it could have never happened, really, but it, it did. Once Wind and Weathering came out, it, your band, Genesis, could have kind of carried on doing that kind of stuff and, and gone the sort of the way of Camel or someone, you know, just yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> our music and we, we'll stay in that world forever. But slowly, slowly pop music comes in and and starts to change the group into a much more commercial group bigger than you've ever been with 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 peter what was the album after winter mothering i'll be blank here what came after winter mothering duke was that duke duke okay now that's that's important actually not so much because of it went that way but because we when peter left we all thought fuck no one knows who wrote the song so we put on that written by so and so we used our own names and then it was a little bit like we became a bit, I think, a bit stereotyped, a bit like, well, I'll do, I'll do acoustic song by Mike Rutherford, and there'll be a something by Phil, and turn into a longer piece. And I think we suddenly thought, let's do some more writing together. You know, as a band, the songs you enjoy the most, the ones you co-write. So we started writing together as a band again for more songs on our album. And that's why, well, not why we're being poppy, but I think you sort of, um, you know, also the other thing is look at the way Peter changed. You know, you, yeah. you, you don't keep doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, and the first song that sort of came on the album was Turn, turn It On Again. That's right. Which we know is it was not a pop song because the chorus came at the end actually, so it's never a hit. <laughs> Phil started writing too. That that was an American hit. 
And is Abacab the structure of the song? It was at one point, yeah. <laughs> but it's A, B, oh. A, C, A, B. Yeah, bit A, bit B, bit C. St standard pop song structure, yeah. Yep. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I guess that's the other thing is you you started, and, and I guess that must have come, did that come from Phil originally about beginning to write about real things, about love, about relationships, stuff that was much more conventional in pop music? Yeah, I mean, Phil could do that. I could never sort of say, I, 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 or Banks, you know, uh, I love you, sort of such personal songs. We went more that way. I think it wasn't an, an intentional thing that we were going to change. And I always sort of contest slightly. Um, you know, the, the last few albums have always, always had a long 15-minute, 12-minute song in it. Um, but what also did happen, we had a lot of success single-wise, but of course, remember, MTV came in, and so a hit was such a huge thing around the world, it dwarfed the album. And people sort of forgot the album was actually had other songs on it too. And the, also, do you not think there's a slight, a certain irony in that? Because you were a massive MTV band. I remember, especially, you know, you, you were always on MTV. Uh, do you not think it, it's ironic that uh, once you start writing about more conventional day-to-day -day subjects, you get the videos? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was for us, you know, our generation was quite a jump, really, you know, because un until MTV came along, no one knew what it looked like. You know, you wore the same T-shirt the entire tour, really. You never worried about how people perceived you. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny. There was no visual presence of the band. You know, the album covers went to us. And so suddenly you're on, on the screen, which is kind of weird. Luckily, Phil was a fantastic frontman, and he carried it um, and added the humour, too. Well, I think that, that was the key. It was, and, and it was something that was with you guys right from the beginning. Prog music is sort of known for its lack of sense of humour, but there was always a sense of humour yeah. with Genesis, you know, whether it's the giant hogweed or Get Him Out by Friday or Harold the Barrel. You know, there was, there was always comedy elements in, in Peter's lyrics and Peter's stuff, right, as well. And, and then when Phil took over, who's, you know, artful dodger, I mean, what he does with that tambourine, you know, that, I mean, you couldn't get more musical theatre than that kind of stuff. You could imagine him playing uh, in, in, in Mary Poppins. The humour was perfect for your video kind of yeah. personalities of who you were. And it's a very British thing. And the Americans love it. It goes back to the Beatles and the goons. Well, you ended up doing full satire, didn't you? I mean, you, you satirised your, your cells with the spitting image thing and then the whole televangelist thing. I mean, it was... It was so what was the best video? And actually, it's the one we never had anything to do with the spitting image. You know, we never did, we didn't do anything apart from giving the song, you know. Uh, but that was great. Yeah. How it kind of went down, how it worked. Um, was that a real guitar, the five neck? Did you ever get <laughs> <laughs> the shirt not, called Five Neck? <laughs> not yet, no, not yet. <laughs> Mike, was humor was humor part of your band? Do you think that was something that yeah. kept going all this time backstage? And yeah, I do think so. I mean, we, we've apart from being good friends, we have such a laugh, uh, the three of us together. It's almost what I missed, but when we sort of didn't do very much for a while, you miss that kind of banter. And actually, we, we just we just did a documentary recently on the rehearsal. Uh, just, just because we thought we might never do it, you know, so we filmed it anyway. What comes across is, is that kind of kidding, you know, having fun together. Um, otherwise, you know, we were seeing quite a serious band behind the scenes. It never really felt like that. But of course, then this band, if they're, not, if they're not successful enough already and they're not talented enough, become extraordinary solo artists as well. I mean, Peter's already gone off and done his solo thing. Phil goes off and does his and, it, and, and you end up writing some of the most extraordinary pop songs. It would be enough, Mike Rutherford, to have a career of just the Mike and the mechanics, wouldn't it, really? Yeah. I must admit, I agree. What, what are the odds, you know what I mean? Um, and I think there's something important to remember here is that, you know, most bands do solo things because they're fed up. They feel frustrated within the main band, you know what I mean? They're, 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 they want to spread out. We did it for just a bit for a break. Just have a bit of a break, guys. You've been together all the time. You know, you go on the road for a year, make an album for a year. We were a bit like, well, let's just try doing some stuff. And it kind of, and then we carried on doing solo stuff uh, and the band stuff also for about 20 years. And, you know, Phil was so successful to come back then and uh, carry on with the band was in some ways surprising, but it's sort of just the way we work. The two enhance each other. But just the logistics, just actually managing to do that in such a way that that I, I I don't know if it's so that everyone's got time off when they want and people doing their projects when they want and then everyone's got comes together to do the band when when they want. I mean that's an amazing bit of time management right there. There is a key there, and that, that's having the same manager. Could you imagine, you know, a Phil Collins manager, a mechanics manager, yeah. uh, a Genesis manager? That'd be it'd be fit with Mac, really. But did you ever go on holiday, you guys? I mean, you were just constantly working, weren't you? Well, together. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, good, good point. I mean, yeah, I mean, but in fact, Phil was the one who actually didn't. I mean, he'd come back off tour and do sessions the next day. 
I remember um, when I did live when I did Band Aid with Phil. I noticed he had a key ring, and it and it was a piece of metal that just said "workaholic." It was. It was. Yeah, and maybe that's why I'm still married, and so Tony's still married, and he's not still married. Um, it could be part of it. Um, but you know, also the other thing is, is, you know, you get on a roll, but things are going well. Yeah. It's very easy to, to keep going. You know, it, it's. Uh, I mean, Phil. I mean, he just never stopped for about five years, six years. He just went on and on all the time. You know, I, I had holidays and family stuff and, and kids stuff uh, to break it up. But as I said, you know, when, when it's going so well, it's kind of easy. I mean, that sums it up, doesn't it? We're going to be doing Live Aid in Wembley and Philadelphia. And Phil goes, I'll do both. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Of course, yeah. I mean, the, the, because you can. I, was, in fact, I, I kind of regret it. We, just, we were in a sort of uh, a solo mode at that time. And I was on the day of Live Aid, I was recording the Personal Mechanics album, mixing it in Air Studios in Office Street. I remember sort of thinking, should I have had a chat about doing Genesis? But of course, we, we weren't sort of in the band mode at the time. So, talking of which, the, of the mechanics, did that, did you get what you, you were expecting with it? I mean, the fact that, I mean, it's huge, right? It's, you know, you had those huge hits. Is that what you saw coming? Was that the idea behind it? Or no, no, was, I never, it, was I never it meant had to be a... just something to do on your afternoon off? Yeah, I never had a plan. <laughs> I mean, you never do with these things. That's what I love about it because it's luck. And I remember, I finished the album and Tony Smith said, um, oh, I don't know, we'll try and get a deal in America. I'm not sure we'll get a deal, you know what I mean? And then, of course, it, 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 it worked. But, but things just, uh, I like that. I mean, the, the fact that I, after Phil's huge success, Phil's huge success, the thought of me having something going well was not really on, on the cards. But um, And you'd already made nice. two solo albums, right? Yeah, the one before I sang, and I can't bloody sing, and I thought, never again, you know, hence the mechanics. Ah. But I think what, the Mike, and the, what Mike and the mechanics really showed you as was an incredible songwriter all i need is a miracle and 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 the living years and i mean word of mouth i mean these are incredible songs that have gone on to win awards in their own right i mean they must have be what you were the most proud of well possibly living years is the song i'm the most proud of which i obviously wrote with b a robertson but i think his uh, you know our thought as the genesis the three of us was a bit like well we're having a great time guys but I'm never writing songs with Tony and Phil. I wouldn't mind writing songs with other, with other people. And so this solo career gave us a chance to sort of co-write, in my case, with other writers, which they wouldn't have ever had otherwise. And um, turning the band into an open relationship, you mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it gave me a sort of, not so much a freedom, but a chance to write with other people. Because, like, yeah, but well, BA, that's obviously a match made in heaven, isn't it? I mean, that's worked really well. How did, that song, how did that song come about, Mike? We were, we were writing around the studio, and it was, it was BA's lyric, and his idea, he had a, he had a sort of um, a story about his life and his father. We had the same, we shared the same thing. We lost our father about the same time. We were like, are we crazy writing a song about death? You know, we discussed it. We thought, is this right? You know, is this not a bit crass? Could it not be horrible? Could it not be a car crash? Um... And of course, it, it turned out to be, and of course, Paul Carrick, who I didn't know at the time, had his father died when he was young down the mines. Wow. So wow. when Paul sang it, there was a real story in his performance behind that. Um, and it, it, it just came together and it was, um, I just, for years, people still come up and they sort of, they're tearful and they say, I heard that song, you know. What's nice now is that they use it often when the parents are, are old and frail and sort of heading on their way out, they kind of share the song together as a, a sort of a, a joining thing, which is rather oh, wow. nice. Because you wrote a book about your father as well, didn't you? Yeah. Um, it's really about, trying to, in a sense, trying to compare our, our lives, the generational time of my father, you know, Royal Navy, two world wars, and then my generation. So in a way, no wonder we went somewhere else. You know, pop music, mm -hmm. kids culture, clothes, that sort of 60s was, was, was due to come. Our parents had been stuck in a sort of certain way of life for a long time. Change was due. But you did a similar job in a way. You did a traveling job. You did a. Yeah. You know, no, I'm exactly. I mean, I, I, writing the book, I found myself thinking, actually, we shared a lot of things in different ways. He was away for, he was away for years. And it's what it was. But um, I've, I've always thought that because I come from a naval background as well. Yeah. And, um, and I've always thought that, it, that, that joining a band has actually got more to do with running away to sea than. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think, yeah. And, and it's always, that's why it's very hard having families sometimes, you know, but Angie, my wife's always been very um, understanding. That's what I do, you know, um, and her glass is very much uh, half full. And, and not full. We, we still talk about, we still talk about the second British invasion, the first British invasion. I mean, it's, it's cultural, uh, it's our cultural empire in a way, isn't it? What, what, what Western <laughs> yeah. music has, has spread. It's, it's true, isn't it? It's not the, it's not the British visit. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> Mind you, it's the, it, now it would be the British quarantine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, bloody yes.
Oh, Mike, are you cycling still? Uh, yeah, I am. Not today. I'm actually, what I'm doing is not, I'm riding, I'm back riding horses again. I, I stopped playing polo for years ago and I didn't ride very much, but I, I, I ride most days and I cycle a bit. Where are you? Uh, I'm, I'm home, Sussex, West Sussex. Oh, I'm right. home, yeah, on the farm. And um, hit a few golf balls around the lawn. It, it's, um, I mean, it could, people have had such a hard time. I've managed very well because where I live and what I'm doing, you know, I'm lucky that way. But uh, it's tough for obviously all our friends yeah. and all the guys, you know, all, all the crew and the lighting guys. That's yeah, that's, yeah. Awful. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Well, a pleasure. And it's about, I'll, I'll, so just going forward, what are you guys doing with, what's your plans with Nick this year? Um, uh, in the autumn? Well, as, as, obviously, as you know, with, uh, with no, nothing in the autumn. I was going to say, as it's Tony, obviously, we don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think we're, well, we, um, this isn't for public consumption, is it? Obviously, this isn't going to go out. Well, as, as you know, it's already been, our tour in Europe has already got announced yesterday that it was being oh, that's next, it yeah. moved to next year. Because so. when, 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 when was it put back to? Well, it's in April, I think. It was. Do the yeah, it was the fourth. yeah, this is the fourth move. I think this is the oh, fourth gracious, move back. And now Amer America's been moved back to next January. I know, it's just it's crazy, really. Uh, we just have to see. September for us, but who knows? Really? But do you, you know, well, that's great, because you'll be amongst the first out, Mike. You'll be, you know, you'll have the most sort of grateful audience the world has ever known. Seated, I think seated audiences, there might be an element of, of uh, vaccine passports or testing of some sort. But, yeah. I think I think seated audiences, but the difficult thing is, is if you've already sold tickets, it's going to be really hard to thin the audience out into any social distancing. I, I can't I, I can't face that anyway. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do that. Funnily enough, you know, we, are you jabbed, Mike? Are you jabbed? I've had one, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, about a month uh, early Feb, and I think um, I think we might. Well, uh, America might be in November, East Coast. America feels confident. They're like, we're going to do it, boy. You know. They feel confident they're going to do it in America. I think November's are probably the right time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because there isn't some sort of winter surge. But you know what it's like in America. Yeah. There's so many gung-ho. They banged on, haven't they? Haven't, yeah. It's. I think we'll, we'll all get there in the end because culture yeah. will be out. We, we, people are desperate to see it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right, guys. Good talking to you. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, really appreciate I'm your time. It's really honour to have you on. Yeah. We're really well, I, I, absolute pleasure. Um, well, that was wonderful speaking to Mike. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we got something that people haven't got before. But I said, but Gary, you were the absolute pub quiz champion on on Genesis knowledge there. The early stuff, I I, I don't know. Did it really? I just I do love that early stuff, particularly. I I start no, to. I, I do I do too. But and I thought I knew it, but you were literally mastermind specialist subject, mate. <laughs> oh, thank God, my prog creden credentials are staying high. Who knew? Yeah, so, yeah, you wouldn't have been saying that 10 years ago. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah, <it's> like... <laughs> Listening to Genesis all night long. <laughs> oh, prog rock. Listening to Foxtrot all night long. <laughs> God, it's long. <laughs> Don't ask me to sing it like I did. No. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, we love doing this job. Yeah. And the more you listen, the more we can get them in. And I know I've seen the list of people who've said yes, and it's pretty good. I'm very excited about future rock on tours. Oh, I haven't seen the list. No, <laughs> yes, I know some of them. Oh, no, it's just me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that how many, have I missed another email? Anyway, uh, please subscribe, leave lovely reviews, and keep listening. Uh, we'll see you next week. And it's good night from me. And good night from them.